Okay, good afternoon and welcome everyone to this public meeting, Regulating Online Advertising, What Next? Uh, my name is Jonathan Hardy. I'm a professor of communications and media at the London College of Communication, part of the University of the Arts London. And today's event is part of work for a three year research project on branded content governance that examines the rules and practices for media and communications content that is paid for or produced by marketers. So our project explores what's happening when media and advertising merge and converge and what kinds of rules and standards um, there are at the moment or should be in the future to address this space. So our event today is really well linked to those core concerns for our project. Um, our project brings together over 80 academics worldwide, some of whom are here today, um, together with industry practitioners, and we have industry partners who are, you'll see on the, the um, slide, the Branded Content Marketing Association, the Content Marketing Association, and Open Democracy. Um, I'm what's called in the jargon, the principal investigator for the project, and I'm delighted to say my co-investigators are here and are joining us for this event. Uh, Professor Ian McCrory from the University of Stirling and Patricia Nunes Gomez um, from University Complutense Madrid. Um, none of our work would be possible without the support of our respective universities. So we thank them, um, University Arts London, Stirling and Complutense, and certainly would not be possible without the funding support we've received from our sponsors. Um, two UK research councils have come together in, in many ways, a unique partnership supporting research at the intersection of media and advertising, um, the Economic and Social Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And um, obviously we're immensely grateful for the support to enable this work to take place. So first of all, I'd really like to welcome all of you. Um, this event is designed to interest and serve quite a diverse audience. And I hope we'll acknowledge that in how we proceed. We have students from the UK and beyond. We have academics and researchers. We have partners involved in our project, um, people from industry, from civil society and beyond. So we will try to be as welcoming and I hope accessible in, in addressing the issues um, we want to look at this afternoon as, as we proceed. Um, I'd also just like to highlight a few housekeeping arrangements. Um, this event is being recorded and we plan to put um, an edited transcript um, with captions up on the University of Arts London website for our project as soon as possible, because we think the issues that we're addressing today um, are, are very timely and will reach a, a wider audience. So um, if you think of questions you'd like to ask, do put them in the question and answer as we go. Um, that's very welcome. And we'll try and work through as many of those as we can when we come to the question and answer session. Um, you can make an anonymous comment, uh, that's fine. Um, if you want to give us details of your name and where you're from, if you're a student or an academic or, or from industry, that would be most welcome. And um, one rule we're going to apply, if you would be willing to speak and um, articulate your question or, you know, say a bit more around it, make a brief comment, um, please put your name in capitals. And we won't call on anyone who doesn't do that. But if you do do that, uh, we might call on you to see if you'd like to um, uh, speak at the meeting uh, alongside the panelists. Um, so I provided a little bit of context for the meeting, but just before we get going, I'd like to just provide a little bit more. The wider context for our meeting today is the ongoing disruption in the digital era and the question of how to respond to that. The old world of media and advertising was governed by relatively settled relationships between three key groups, um, marketers, marketing agencies, advertising agencies, and the media. And one of the challenges we're grappling with is that those three groups, which I sometimes call a triad, remain in place, but they're being joined by 
and disrupted by and affected by other key groups that have uh, joined in. I call it a move from a triad of three to a sextet of six, because three key groups that have been added are platforms, creators, social media influencers who often operate outside of that old world, and technology, specifically ad tech. So platforms, creators, and ad tech are adding challenges and disruption to an old world governed by the relationship between marketers, marketing agencies, and media. And we've invited today a really stellar panel um, of people involved in regulation, involved in practice, um, with a legal understanding, as well as academics, um, to give their views and help uh, us all actually understand uh, what's happening and how we might want to respond to it. Okay, so that's the overall context. Um, if I can have, next slide, please. Um, so briefly, just to put this in the frame, this is our research project. Um, it's ongoing for three years. And obviously for us, we hope this will be of value and benefit to the entire community of our respective universities. For me, the University of the Arts London in providing resources um, to help students um, as well as staff researchers um, through contacts, through networking, through a deeper understanding that will help them in their careers and trajectory once they graduate. Um, and as I say, we have um, partners and, and others involved in the project. So that's a wider context and I invite my colleagues, um, Patricia, uh, Patricia Nunes Gomez, Neil McCrory to say a little bit more uh, before we close today. Um, next slide, please. The immediate context in the UK are three policy documents that have emerged, all of which address this new environment and questions about what's happening, what practices are going on in media and marketing, and how they um, are being addressed in regulation and governance and how they should be addressed. So um, the one on the top right is a report from a UK parliamentary commission, um, sorry, committee, um, influencers, lights, cameras in action. You get a feeling for a critique uh, involved in this report, which indeed there is. So this is an analysis of what's happening in um, the world of influencer marketing and whether the, the regulatory arrangements to address that are sufficient. That's a topic we'll pick up in a moment. On the top left is the online safety bill, obviously a major piece of legislation um, currently going through the UK Parliament. And that deals with um, advertising only in a limited extent. Uh, it deals with fake advertising, essentially, and impersonation. But um, it's important in doing so, and it connects to a wider discussion about how platforms um, need to be brought into discussions of uh, communications, regulation and governance. And down at the bottom is probably the major piece of, uh, of policy action around which our discussions frame. So this is a government um, outlining of a set of proposals for how online advertising should be regulated going forward. And um, amongst other things, that document says there are three main options, and I want to invite my panelists to give their views on these. One of them is to stay much the same as we have at the moment, which is um, advertising content being largely managed by an advertising self-regulatory system governed by the Committee on Advertising Practice, um, a member of whom is here to speak to you today, and overseen by the Advertising Standards Authority. So that, that's broadly what we have at the moment. Uh, and the government floats two options. One is to strengthen that system um, and provide more what's called statutory legal support. And the third option is to move to a full new statutory regulator for advertising. So this is a moment of quite profound questions about what direction uh, we should take that frame our debate. Um, next slide, please. Um, so 
In a moment, we'll open up those issues with Emma Smith, who I've just mentioned, who's the operations manager for the Committee of Advertising Practice in the UK. Jason Freeman, um, who's the director of consumer law at what's called a statutory regulatory body, the Competition and Markets Authority, which currently implements European Union law, including law that protects consumers. Um, so that's operative in the UK, but of course, where that goes next um, is uncertain in a post-Brexit landscape. Um, Lexi kakonal kuana who's the head of regulation for um, a regulator, key regulator for news publishing um, and wider publishing in the UK, Impress. Um, and Geraint Lloyd-Taylor, who's a partner at a legal firm, Lewis Silkin, who are undoubtedly uh, in a leadership position in advising their clients on media and advertising law. And he is indeed an expert on the field. So um, there's myself, Jonathan Hardy, um, and my two colleagues joined today, I'm delighted to say, also with another professor who's involved in our research project, uh, Professor Celia Rangel Perez, who will speak a, a little bit about um, some parallel developments in Spain. So finally, just to next slide, please. Um, just to offer you a few illustrations of the kind of issues we might touch on later. Um, one of the key questions I'll be asking the panel is to give their views on the direction of travel for media and advertising regulation in general. Um, but a second set of questions really arise from the fact that currently we have some differences, some anomalies in the treatment of social media marketing, um, i.e. new forms of marketing and older forms of marketing, such as apply to newspapers. We've essentially had a strengthening of guidance and rules to ensure that social media marketers make clear to their users um, if there's any commercial relationship with a brand or sponsor, to make those relationships clear, whether it's a gift or whether it's a uh, contractual relationship, and to do so in fairly clear and consistent ways, usually, not exclusively, you by using hashtag ad, by clarifying that advertising content is appearing. And one of the things that throws up is uh, a media form which has existed for nearly 350 years uh, is not um, practicing um, disclosure of advertising with the same consistency and clarity, um, it, it may be argued. So just to open up that debate, I thought I'd share with you a few examples we, we might reflect on, um, all of which were produced by UK newspapers in the last month. So the first one in some ways fairly standard, um, of course, a timely guide to cheap holidays in 2023 produced, you'll see at the top, in association with TikTok. So that's a standard, but some would argue not particularly clear identification of the commercial relationship shaping that content. Um, next slide, please, Alex. Um, the second one, perhaps even more so, is another piece in the Evening Standard in which the print copy article discloses no relationship with, with brands at all. Um, if you're reading this, this appears and is labeled as pure editorial. In fact, if you read it, it's highly promotional copy throughout. Um, but perhaps a key point is that in the online version of this article, um, you may see in tiny type, I've probably made this unreadable for you, but perhaps that's part of the point, um, a disclosure which says the evening standard um, journalism is supported by our readers when you purchase th through links, um, uh, on our site, we may earn an affiliate commission. So there's an indirect reference being made to the fact that the article you're about to read may be connected to affiliate marketing links, as indeed it is. So we have some anomalies, even amongst the same publisher on two different platforms in the disclosure of a commercial relationship. Um, third slide, please, Alex. And, and this is a piece from, again, a, a, a timely piece for people thinking of the new year and how they might uh, respond to that in a more healthy approach. So this is a moment when slimming um, activity is promoted 
But here in the Express, um, the entire article is written by not a journalist, but as it says here, Slimming World. So this is a piece of content which is obviously um, brand produced, um, brand controlled, it's written by the brand, um, and it should disclose itself, therefore, accordingly as branded content. But uh, if you look around this page, there is no such disclosure whatsoever. So it highlights essentially a set of issues and tensions between uh, the regulations emerging for new media and some of those that are um, uh, applicable, but not being applied across old media. And that's an illustration of some of the wider issues that we uh, want to raise with our panel today. So next slide, please, Alex. So um, without more ado, and we'll go to visual so you can see our panel in a moment, but if you just quickly scan down, uh, we're going to frame the discussion with panelists around kind of three key topic areas. Um, as I've raised. Firstly, more broadly, what is the case for change, the case for reform, and what direction should it take? Um, secondly, an issue of how the current rules require disclosure of content. And thirdly, this wider issue about if there is ongoing convergence across the media, is it suitable to have differential treatment, um, in practice at least, across at new media and old media? How should we address these seeming anomalies um, in, in the area of consistent identification and disclosure of content? So that's the menu, but um, you are all extremely welcome. And we will open up after a few rounds of comments from the panel to questions and discussion with you all before we finish, I promise, on time at 5.30. So without more ado, um, Alex, can we go to a screen where we can see our panelists? Uh, and let me so introduce again, uh, for those who've just joined. So we have Emma Smith, who is the uh, Operations Manager for the Committee of Advertising Practice, Jason Freeman, who is the Director of Consumer Law for the Competition and Markets Authority, Lexi connell kawana who is the head of Impress, uh, sorry, the head of regulatory um, regulation at Impress, and Garant Lloyd Taylor, who's a partner at Lewis Silk Silkin. And I'll ask my question principally to them, to those first. So um, to open up the first topic area, then, um, the Advertising Standards Authority is a self-regulatory agency that enforces advertising codes written by the Committee of Advertising Practice and it was established in 1962. The government's online advertising program has considered, as I say, three options for advertising regulation, staying the same, strengthening self-regulation, or applying statutory regulation. Um, what are the proposals? Do you want to say more about them and which would you favor and support? Um, on my screen, the first person I could see is Lexi. So I'd like to invite you to go first on that question, Lexi. Certainly. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, and I do have the benefit, not only um, now press regulation is my specialism, I've also formerly worked um, at the Advertising Standards Authority um, with Emma as one of my colleagues. So I have a bit of an inside scoop, uh, inside track on that regulatory practice as well. And, you know, I inherently, I do believe that um, self-regulation or co-regulatory models um, work well for the space. Um, they're much more nimble and agile than statutory uh, regulatory products. Um, but one of the, the kind of key regulatory issues here, I think, is that we have in the UK around five to eight regulatory bodies dealing with content services. So you've got the ASA, you've got the CMA, you've got Ofcom, uh, the ICO, you've got bodies like Impress. Um, and so that question around the proposals is that do we need another regulator to add into that kind of lineup of uh, content service regulators, or do we need to consolidate the issue of regulation? And to me, that comes down to, you know, what is the harm we're trying to prevent here and what style of regulation best addresses that harm head on? because you do have um, the sort of upstream regulation techniques like 
pre-bidding publications. Um, you've got the Ofcom style um, of broadcast regulation where it's looking at that live linear control. But then you had the other more downstream uh, regulation techniques and practices, um, such as complaints handling and providing redress after the fact or sort of post publication. And I think that, so as I said, I think the question here is what is the harm we're trying to prevent? What regulation style best addresses that? Is there a suitable body in the market that can address that as it stands? Um, or do we need better consolidation across all of the regulatory bodies that exist? Um, and one example, uh, just before I close, is to think about how Ofcom has grown outside of its remit since its inception um, in, the, in the 60s, which is that it starts off as a broadcast regulator, becomes a telco, and then becomes a broadband regulator, and now we're bolting on internet services. And I think there's an inherent risk with um, thinking about the capacity of regulators and their remit. Um, and just bolting on more and more remit and scope for them to deal with these issues, rather than going back to that first principle question of what's the harm, what's the best form of regulation, and therefore how do we consolidate the existing powers across the existing bodies so it can best address this harm that manifests. Thank you very much, Lexi. Um, I'm now going to turn to two people who have certainly both been architects of formal responses to the government's proposals. So can I ask um, Jason to speak next from the Competition and Markets Authority and then Emma? Yeah, hello. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I think um, on the topic of who should regulate what, I think ge ge generally, I mean, we are, we are sort of systems neutral. Um, so it's not, it, it, it's not something which we have a, a strong view on who should regulate. Obviously, that's something for the government to take a view on and they will they will form a view on that. But I think the most important thing is that um, regulation should be consistent. Um, regulators should work together to um, ensure that there, there aren't unnecessary uh, uh, confusion, there, shouldn't, there isn't unnecessary uh, duplication or inconsistency. And in this space, so the, in, in the area of influencer marketing, we've been working very closely with the Advertising Standards Authority. Uh, and indeed, we've produced um, joint guidance on influencer marketing with, with them, uh, which is probably is due for a refresh now. Um, and I, I dare say that'll be coming out fairly soon. And um, we also produced some guidance as to who does what in this space, which we produced in November, uh, 2022. So, you know, it, 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 there is obviously with, with multiple regulators, there is inevitably this, the possibility for people to be confused or for people to not quite understand who does what. Um, and we, we do our best to try and alleviate that. And so that hence we put, put forward that guidance. It's also important that there should be high standards of protection. The UK has always taken the position that consumers uh, should have a high standard of protection. Uh, the UK has never sought to um, uh, cut corners there or to um, leave people unprotected. And so the, a high standard of protection is important. And, it, and it's important simply for the... the um, the level of trust that is necessary for consumers to drive effective markets. You know, if consumers feel unprotected, they feel that there are high risks in engaging in a sector, then that sector won't necessarily thrive. People will exit the sector, they won't spend their money there, they lose trust and that's a problem. So uh, there's a, there are very good market reasons why consumers should have a high level of trust uh, and that requires a high level of protection. So, you know, at the end of the day, if um, if there, is, if there are high standards being enforced and there is consistency and proper collaboration between regulators, then that is uh, a great achievement. And of course, regulators need to be properly resourced uh, to do their work. Um, it, there, there is inevitably a risk, uh, it seems to me, with consumer enforcement that um, the number of problems that you can tackle always outstrips the amount of resource that any regulator has. Uh, and so regulators need to be properly resourced one way or another that that needs to be built into the system. Um, and where uh, we're working with industry, uh, we would look to industry to self regulate in an appropriate fashion because that's consistent with um, professional diligence. And indeed, that's something which the CMA has sought to uh, work on in, in this space. So, for example, giving um, guidance to platforms about how platforms can uh, help in a way to um, prevent harm to consumers appearing on their platforms and doing so 
um, in a way voluntarily, but within the framework of the law. So we, we take a, a view that generally platforms are required to do uh, a fair amount uh, to comply with the law in terms of checking things and having the right standards in place. And we produced um, guidance for platforms in that space as well. So you know, the, whole, uh, the whole ecosystem needs to work well together. So I feel in a way I've answered your question and in a way I haven't answered your question because as I say we're not, um, uh, we are neutral as to who, who does what in the sector as it, as it were. But I think uh, the, the, uh, the enforcement regime needs to have those uh, features which I've described. Thanks. Thank you very much. And following on from that, um, Emma from the Committee of Advertising Practice. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to add too much more to what's been said. I think Lexi really hit it on the head there. It, it really depends what harm you're trying to address and then looking at exactly what works for that type of harm. Um, as far as the ASA system is concerned, um, we welcome the review. Um, absolutely, it's always worth, especially at kind of key points in history like this where there, there are lots of uh, converging medias uh, and uh, media types um, as to whether we're getting it right, whether we're, we're in the right place, whether we have the right protections in place. Um, and we also agree that any reform should be proportionate um, to, the, to the problems and to the harms um, that we're talking about. And as an evidence-based regulator, we're very keen obviously to see the evidence base for the suggested changes um, and the suggested uh, options for reform, um, because uh, I think as it as it stands, some of the options we're not necessarily convinced that we've seen the evidence uh, that would back up the the change in the way they suggest, especially when you balance it out with the cost associated with some of those options. Um, particularly in terms of addressing the types of harm that the ASA is primarily concerned with, which is that of genuine advertising placed by legitimate marketers. Um, the ASA has much less to do with fraudulent advertising and criminal uh, activity um, or kind of any harms that might be leveled uh, or addressed at the industry themselves in terms of the kind of uh, financial arrangements and supply chain issues, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think from, from our perspective, we've submitted a very full and lengthy and com comprehensive response uh, to the government and we await with bated breath <laughs> to see what uh, to see how how they make sense of the I understand hundreds of responses they must have received to this uh, and to see where they come out on it. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, I, I'll invite Garant in a moment, but I suppose just to pick up one point and, and explain to our audience why we're framing this debate in some ways. Um, Lexi mentioned Ofcom and Ofcom is what's called in the UK a super regulator. And it came through a discussion um, in the 1990s that asked the question, do converging media need converging regulation? Uh, and at the time, the UK had separate regulation for telecommunications, for broadcasting, um, for computing, essentially, and for the press. And the solution was to bring some of them, but not all of them, as Lexi knows, the press was left outside um, into a statutory regulatory framework. And I guess for us, well, firstly, I'm really grateful for everything that's been said, because for our research project, drawing on these insights about what makes good governance um, to inform understanding of proposals is very important. Um, but also, I suppose we think it's a moment to ask that question again, do converging media need converging regulation, and ask it specifically in the context of the changes that are taking place in the media and advertising space. Um, so uh, that's a frame. Garant, please, on this question. Sure, I, I agree with Emma that uh, Lexi's answered it very well uh, yeah. as to the original question. And yeah. just my observations would be that we do have, I don't know what the collective noun is for regulators, but a, a gaggle of regulators mm -hmm. at the moment, sort of evolving in a piecemeal fashion. Uh, the most recent example probably is HFSS advertising. So foods that are high in fat, sugar and salt have been sort of handed to Ofcom, I believe I'm right in saying. Ofcom, I think, always has a sort of surprised and reluctant look in its face when it's given these jobs, I imagine, behind closed doors, but they sort of, they, they staunchly carry on. I do think in other areas like environmental claims, where we do see the ASA and the CMA working hand in hand, it can be done. Um, and it is done very well in that, in that particular space. And I applaud both the ASA and the CMA for that. When you add more regulators to the mix and nobody's quite sure who's dealing with what, it can get too complicated, I would say. Um, but 
yes, there is. It, it's time to consolidate and clarify, I think, where the rules are. And I think when it comes to misleading advertising, we've got it just about right. And when the question is, well, should other sort of woollier parts of the CAP code be enforceable in some sort of statutory way, I agree with Emma that I don't think the case has been made for that. I think that's a, a step up in regulation. Um, and I too would like to see the sort of benefits of it and the relative costs and, and so on, rather than it being a sort of instinctual move forward by a government that I think when it was proposed was very keen on regulation in all in all spheres. And I think that has cooled over the last sort of maybe six to 12 months, um, which might mean that level heads prevail and we'll have a, a sensible way forward based on evidence. OK, thank you. Well, if I may, I'll move on to the second topic, invite some comments on that, and then we'll invite some contributions from um, Patricia and Celia uh, picking up these points. So the second topic is this. The Influencer Culture Report I mentioned at the start, um, produced by the UK Parliamentary Committee for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, uh, made numerous proposals, including that advertising self-regulation should adopt the same position as UK and EU law, namely that if a trader pays for a promotion, that should be made clear to the reader. The self-regulator currently, the, the CAP system um, overseen by the Advertising Standards Authority, currently requires evidence of editorial control um, by the marketer over the content as well as payment. Uh, which approach is suitable, EU, UK law or the, um, what's often known as a dual test of um, payment and editorial control um, across the media space. Which approach is suitable? What should be done? Um, can I go around again? And since that is directed, I guess, at Emma, um, perhaps Emma, you would speak first. Sure. Um, so I think it's this is a tricky one because I think the question seems to suggest that there's a difference in approach um, at play here. when there isn't really that the underlying law is the law <laughs> and that is the approach if there is payment there should be disclosure um the the difference comes in based on the fact that we're an advertising regulator so we restrict our remit to advertising content um there will be occasions where a marketer has provided some for form of payment to a, a publisher or, or a creator but has had no say or impact whatsoever on the particular content that was created and in those cases it wouldn't be appropriate for an advertising regulator to start applying say our rules on uh, promoting hfss products or um or requiring them to hold evidence for every material uh, objective claim so i think that's the point at which we kind of shaped our remit to make sure that we cover advertising content um but the law is still the law, <laughs> so that requirement still applies um, to to yeah all all players uh, in this space. Um, so we don't really make an apology any apology for having a remit test that keeps within our remit what we consider to be advertising content. Um, so yeah, thank you, Emma. Thank you very much. I guess I better turn to Jason um, from the CMA, um, then Lexi, and then Garant on this. Yeah, thank you. So, um, as you rightly say, the uh, consumer legal position, which is set out in the Consumer Protection from Unfair Trading Regulations 2008, um, doesn't have a control test. It looks at the question of whether somebody is a trader and if they're a trader, whether they're engaged in commercial practices. And then if those commercial practices are in some way unlawful, so are they misleading? Uh, so either that they, they are untruthful because they lie in some way or they're deceptive or they omit material information or they're lacking in professional diligence. So that's the test that we have applied. And um, uh, we've, we've done uh, quite a lot of work in the area of influencer marketing and reviews and the market for reviews and uh, whether all reviews are being disclosed and that sort of thing uh, over the past um, quite, quite a few years, actually. Uh, and um, we've found that the law actually works quite well in, 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 a, in enabling us to tackle practices which we feel should be uh, tackled. Um, it's it's fair to say that um, we haven't had we haven't yet had to take any cases to court. So whether a court will uh, support us and that you know we just don't know the answer to that. But we believe a court would do, uh, and so we continue to produce guidance 
uh, based on our enforcement position, which we've established through many um, enforcement cases that we've taken and which have been settled with uh, by traders giving us acceptable commitments um, in, in this area. And we've, we've looked at people all around the, the different um, aspects of uh, the market. So we've looked at uh, influencers themselves. We've looked at people who are arranging marketing. So they're organizing blogs or you know, running a marketing campaign. We've looked at the brands who initiate all of this by perhaps sending out free gifts to people uh, or um, more directly commissioning um, uh, ab you know, some form of advertising um, and setting it in, in motion. Um, and we've looked at the platforms as well. And, and all, all the way around all of these areas, we have found that the law uh, provides the coverage which uh, we think we need to uh, uh, tackle this, these, these, these sets of practices. Thank you very much. Lexi. Yes, so um, to, to Jason's point, I think that the rules themselves, um, you know, they are wide enough that there are these interpretive discretions within them. And I don't think we, we would you know, accept that there's a gap in the rules necessarily. There may be issues around informant, uh, enforcement and compliance. Um, and that's maybe where we're seeing these kind of worst case scenarios. Um, and, and there is an issue about resourcing and capacity to address those. So, you know, there are, there are as many um, ads and advertisers and traders as there sort of are businesses in the UK. Um, and it's a huge, huge remit to cover. So it all comes down to this question of proportionality and impact. Where are you going to have the most impact as a regulator enforcing these rules? And there are trade-offs there where you're not going to capture absolutely every offender in the market. Um, and um, as Jason said, fortunately, you know, haven't had to go to the extent of course court enforcement, um, but, but there are issues about vis uh, visibility, particularly in within the digital economy, um, where uh, it's very hard to see the breadth of offending that's taking place um, and know, and again, make that evidence case for why you would um, you know, increase the proportion of resources being dedicated to those practices. So, so I, I, it's my view that, um, you know, again, regulators with competency over advertising and trading um, should stick to that, you know, that business, that area, um, and that having them make decisions over editorial um, is, is, not, is not an ideal situation, particularly if they don't have competency to address news and editorial. Um, but but there are enforcement gaps, and I know that we'll move on to in the next question the issues of um, publishing and media compliance with these rules and standards as well. And I'm happy to go into more detail there because there are two sides to that coin, certainly. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Garant. Um, yes, uh, I think the devil is always in the detail with these things, and you can have these broad principles, but the day-to-day -day, uh, enforcement of them is is where you know, ideal as a lawyer. I mean, people come to me not because it's straightforward, but because it's not straightforward. And, and that's when, when we test these rules to uh, destruction almost, um, we, we find where those sort of rough edges are, I think. In broader terms, I think the ASA doesn't have jurisdiction over media owners really, but rather over advertisers. And that can be a challenge sometimes to the ASA and everybody involved in the process because it might be a targeting issue. It might be a labeling issue that could be fixed by a platform, for example. And that's where the CMA might have more of a sort of, of, of an ability to intervene. Um, and, you know, perhaps it's time that the platforms are addressing this in a bit more of a direct way and making a more sort of standardized, easy approach for people. I see that they they do a lot of that and they've introduced labels like sponsored and so on. But interestingly, it's all sort of taxonomy that the ASA doesn't really agree with. You can't apply sponsored and expect people to understand that it's an advertisement, not a sponsorship message, for example. Um, I think that's that's where I was going to say the, the sort of rough edges are to some extent is that interaction between platform and influencer. There are other instances where, as we know, the influencer might be creating content off their own back and then brands are held jointly responsible for it. And I think that is another area where brands are to some extent victimized. I don't, I don't think anyone has particularly deep sympathy with brands in this sort of situation. But if you haven't really paid for content to be created, you haven't seen it. Um, you think actually when you have seen it that it's obvious enough that it's all sort of 
uh, referring to a brand partnership that somebody had six months ago, even though it doesn't use the word ad. Um, the brands can be dragged into these investigations, um, albeit that they've had nothing to do with the content. And that's another area of, of, of concern. And as Lexi says, we won't, there are editorial examples as well where publishers and journalists uh, might be in a sort of similar situation where they're getting dragged in, or it's not obvious whether something is pure editorial or not paid for, but it might be on the periphery of being paid for because something indirectly has been paid for, either a trip or whatever, or there might be an affiliate link that's been disclosed, but there's other sort of positive editorial presented around it, um, that even if that editorial itself is not paid for or controlled, there are instances where the ASA has still decided that A, it has jurisdiction, and B, it should be labelled advertisement rather than anything else. So this is where I work day to day, and these are the areas where we do struggle to get clarity, I think, from the regulators, understandably, because they cannot legislate for every little example and nuance. Um, but as I say, this is where the real sort of intricacies lie, I think. Thank you so much. So as in other areas, the kind of clarity of the regulatory framework for all the actors um, with, without overreach or overlap is a call a number of you have made. Um, I've got one question to ask all the panel before we go to questions. But just before I do, um, we've touched on the fact that EU law currently in place in the UK requires that if a trader pays for promotion, that that's made clear for the readers. So could I just quickly invite um, Patricia and Celia, if you'd like to make any comment on the issues you've heard so far from the perspective of parallel developments or comparable developments, at least in Spain. Celia. Okay. Um, you go ahead or? Okay. okay. <laughs> so, thank you. I mean, I'm hearing all of you, all of the issues in the UK and they're very interesting. I would say that, I mean, the European directive is from 2018. Um, we had um, a voluntary code of conduct from the main uh, Spanish Arbitration Association from 2020, in which they say that every uh, paid collaboration, whether it was monetary or in kind, should be um, identified with advertising collaboration with sponsor, that's a person, whatever. But to be honest, until the, until last year, when the new um, general law of audiovisual communication um, was approved by the Spanish government, uh, it was not until that moment that every or not every single uh, influencer, I was I would say most of them started to put in place that law. I mean, <laughs> tagging that they were uh, doing. Um, a collaboration with brands. Mm -hmm. So, also in editorial content. In editorial content. So, I would say that such regulation is something very, I mean, important. Uh, that in theory, I mean, and also the a European directive put emphasis on such regulation. Mm -hmm. But I would say that at some point we need, I mean, the law to to help us. To uh, yes, because the the audiovisual law. Um, uh, made more emphasis in uh, freedom of expression than, mm -hmm. uh, and also in more than all media, not in social networks. So it's very difficult, and some platform has made uh, an special uh, uh, good practice code, uh, as Instagram, for example. But it depends on every platform, or because, they, for example, the, the general law. In Spain, uh, in the case of minor people, uh, says that uh, you have to to label the the times that you can watch TV, etc. But uh, young people are not there, so the law is very confused, and it depends more, as uh, Celia said, about self regulation and also bracket content association, for example, or something like that. Thank you very much, Patricia. Professor Patricia Gomez, the co-investigator for our Branded Content Research Project. And just to explain for those who may have joined us, we have a, a wide um, research project with um, academic advisors from across the world. We're going to explore these rules in um, America, Canada, Mexico, the UK, every EU country and Australia. But we're going to dive deeper in looking at what's happening in the UK and Spain 
so I'm delighted you could join us. So um, with an eye on the clock, I'm going to hopefully allow um, 25 minutes or so for questions. Um, so I've got one more question to put to the panel um, and I'll read it out because it, I hope, gives a bit of context to um, the issue. So the obligations for social media creatives and influencers to declare payments, gifts and affiliate marketing links and other relationships with sponsors are becoming clear, but are not matched across UK journalism. The self-regulator Impress, and Lexi's here as a speaker, has long held that paid for editorial should be disclosed to readers and has recently updated its code. Yet the majority of national news publishers um, are members of IPSO, the independent press standards organization which does not address brand sponsored content in its editor's code. So currently a teenage creator on TikTok working without professional or legal support of any kind has a greater obligation to reveal incentivized content than professional publishers, arguably. In the current debates on the online safety bill, advocates for the newspaper industry call essentially for a carve out to make them not subject to the requirements on other actors on the basis that the um, news publishing industry already has sufficient safeguards for standards in place. It has lawyers, it has responsible and accountable editors, it self-regulates adequately. So we have an anomaly. We seem to have stronger rules um, applied to teenagers than a press which claims for itself um, strong uh, standards. Is it right then, is the question, that news publishers appear to have weaker requirements than influencers to disclose brand sponsored and commercially incentivized content? To the panel. Um, maybe Garant, we should reverse it. What's your view? I think I agree with you that there is a two tier system and I think it's worse than you might think because if you're an influencer, for example, you are not only covered by the cap code, but under the new online safety bill, your content is not really classified as advertising because it's not in a paid for space, mm -hmm. even if arguably by some tests, it would be paid for content in that in that sense, but it doesn't benefit from that in the sense it's not exempted on that basis. So it's covered twice over, if you like. Whereas you're right, journalistic content, genuine editorial might be uh, exempt uh, from the cap code and from uh, the online safety bill. That is um, the sort of easy categories, if you like. I think where it's complicated is, and, and I think this is where there is a lack of clarity and transparency, is there are different kinds of content because there are different arrangements uh, between journalists and publishers and commercial entities. And sometimes there is both payment and editorial control, meaning final editorial control. Sometimes the content is just delivered and provided to you as a publisher for, by the brand. That is just an advert. If you are really controlling it yourself as a publisher, but there's a, some shared editorial control, that's probably an advertorial. Um, but there's another category, which is, you know, somebody might pay for affiliate links. Um, or they might not pay for it, they might not have any say of it. You draw in affiliate links because you think it's relevant to your pure editorial. Um, and it used to be that you would put at the top, this article contains affiliate links, but the ASA doesn't seem to think that's adequate. They think that if the rest of the pure editorial in that content um, relates to the affiliate link, then the whole thing should be labeled as an advertisement. And that's the category I think there hasn't been a recognition of and an appreciation of. Um, and while I think there should be some degree of disclosure, A, I think it's probably adequate to say this article contains affiliate links if there's a complete hands-off approach to the editorial content, but perhaps something like created as part of a commercial association or some other form of words that is clear on its face to consumers might be the answer. I think advertisement as a label is reductive in an unhelpful way because there's too many things are covered by that bracket but there should be some form of disclosure that is developed um, for that other kind of content. Thank you very much indeed, Joanne. And you set a challenge, certainly for our research project, but I think for the wider audience listening to think about what sort of terms are appropriate for, for content. So it's um, clear to users, but perhaps 
a, a better fit for the emergent forms and formats. It's a very interesting and important challenge. So thank you very much for that. Um, Jason. Thank you. Um, so just on that question about is advertisement too reductive? I mean, this is a point which we uh, have included in our most recent guidance on um, influence marketing. And essentially we think the term advert, advertisement ad is the phrase that should be used. And one of the dangers with the multiplicity of slightly more nuanced phrases is, or, you know, obviously the people using them, they, they understand what they're getting at. The problem is whether the reader, the consumer who's looking at it actually understands what's um, uh, being displayed to them. Um, and uh, the view that we've taken, which I think is shared by the ASA as well, is that um, advert ad uh, advertisement is nice and clear for everybody. And that really encapsulates what is actually going on here, which is that somebody is um, paying for or otherwise um, supporting financially uh, advertising of their product. So on the, um, the wider question of uh, what's the position for advertising in the press? Well, the, the position in consumer law uh, is that um, if traders pay a journalist to promote their product, the trader is certainly on the hook for um, misleading um, practices because they are the trader and they're getting the journalist to act in their name or on their behalf. And that would be covered by the consumer protection regulations. And indeed, there is a specific banned pro, um, practice of, um, which is paragraph 11 of schedule one to the regulations, which is using editorial content in the media to promote a product where, where a trader has paid for the promotion without making that clear in the content. Um, and it's got to be something which is, you know, wording or images or sounds which are clearly identifiable by the consumer as that disclosure. So that's, um, that's what the law requires. Um, and so, the, you know, in, in the situations which you've described, I think it's fair to say that uh, you know, if, if an enforcer looked at this, they would probably say, well, you know, the trader needs to make sure that that disclosure is made. Um, as to who enforces against who, uh, clearly there are important issues around freedom of the press. And it may be that Ipso um, would be interested in, in, in looking at practices like that. I note from their editor, editor's code of practice that clause one, um, accuracy, states that the press must take care not to publish inaccurate, misleading or distorted information. So mm -hmm. it seems to me, I mean, I'm not an expert in this space, but it seems to me that that is broadly consistent with what the consumer protection regulations also require, which is that you mustn't mislead people. Um, and certainly, although there are some specific prohibitions around uh, influence marketing, like the one I read out and a, a few other ones as well, the general prohibition on misleading actions, misleading emissions, um, it, it, it seems consistent with that. You know? And if, if people are promoting a product and they're um, in fact being paid uh, to promote it and they're not making that clear, then you know, that looks like it's, um, it's going to be misleading to the reader. Okay, thank you very much. You make a very interesting and important connection to clause one of the editor's code of Ipso. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, Emma next, and then Lexi, perhaps Emma, if you don't mind, just before you speak, can I just queue up um, those of you patiently listening, we're coming to the end, we've got some time for questions. The easiest way to put those questions is to write them in the Q&A function. And just a reminder, if they're anonymous and acceptable for us to read out, that's fine, um, no problem. If you can put your name and designation, that's very helpful to us and to others, just to get an idea of who's speaking and where they're coming from. And if you put your name in capitals, um, then it indicates that you might be willing to speak to your question. And we're very keen to in invite in as many voices as we can before we finish. So if you would like to speak, um, use caps with your question. Um, so please start adding those. And Emma. Uh, well, <laughs> what else to add to, the, to this? Um, I think, I think I would probably highlight that it's important to remember that context is always key and it's kind of key in all regulations. So different contexts 
can, if not exactly justify slightly different approaches, it can provide context for how different regulators approach different um, issues in different contexts, even in, in kind of areas where it would appear on the face of it to be exactly the same. But when you start digging into the very particulars of, of each case, you start to reveal the differences that might, for whatever reason, be dealt with slightly differently, whether it's, you know, we, we've talked before about resource and where you have the most impact and that sort of thing. Um, but also just thinking about how people consume different media in different ways. So if we're talking about influencer marketing, this is being consumed at speed <laughs> with people flicking very quickly through timelines as part of their very busy lives for a very short period of time and they need to know like that that it's advertising they don't need to read something and think hmm, i wonder if this is advertising so they need to know the minute they see it this is advertising but they have a very different experience when they're reading a newspaper because they've chosen to sit down and consume a newspaper so they might have kind of different contextual clues in different places and uh, kind of different things that will make things clear or, or less clear uh, depending on the context so Context, always key. Um, and I think going back to um, Garrett's point um, about kind of ad, um, the ad label, and it is a it is a blunt tool. Like that's kind of, it can't, you, you can't get away from it. And I think we've kind of, we even acknowledged in our research, I think to a certain extent that it isn't a perfect tool by any means, but we're yet to see a better one. <laughs> so it's kind of, we're at the point where more and more consumers are starting to recognize this now. So almost by creating this almost consistent approach, which isn't wholly consistent, but almost consistent, more people are starting to recognize it and it is becoming a better tool. Um, and, I, you know, if you put hashtag ad on a post seven years ago, I don't think anyone would know what it meant. But when you do it now, I imagine a lot more consumers will understand immediately that there is a, a commercial relationship here. Um, and it's, yeah, it, it's one of those things where our research was quite shocking on how little people recognise even brands own posts weren't necessarily identified as being definitely advertising. That's quite scary. <laughs> and I think if you if you took our research at, you know, at its most pure, you might argue that they should be going a lot further <laughs> to make clear that something is advertising, including to the point of making it look so different from the surrounding editorial that it couldn't possibly be confused between the two. That's not necessarily the bus business friendly <laughs> kind of approach that we might want to have to ensure a continued influencer marketing economy, a continuing online marketing economy. Um, so yeah it's it's one of those really tricky and difficult areas um that we will continue to grapple with for as long as we need to thank you so much emma for those insights and um, just to pick up a wider point and i i i think this will resonate for many in our audience and um, well firstly the research on recognition is is indeed shocking and we have colleagues in the us who i think their research averages out the awareness of sponsored editorial content at about 10%. So those are real issues. But I think what you've touched on, just to pick up, is what really excites us about this project. And one of the reasons why we chose the word governance uh, for the Branded Content Research Project, because governance stretches all the way from hard law right through to questions about practice and what practitioners do and how they understand what they do. And we think the space that's opened up, and it's reflected in the fact we had two research councils from um, economics and social science, essentially, and arts and humanities support us, is because we are at an intersection where insights are needed about media, about users, about media forms. And we believe that this is an area that connects um, what used to be quite separated, really, people who study law and regulation and people who study media practice and media cultures. So thank you so much for highlighting so well um, that the importance of those interconnections, which I'm sure people in this audience from different perspectives um, very much share. Okay, so final word on this question um, to Lexi and then anybody else who'd like to come back and then we'll we'll open it up to, to questions and discussion. Lexi. Thanks, Jonathan. Yes, and I will return to the 
uh, question that you posed at the, the beginning of this Thank section, um, which is, do we have a system of um, two tiers? Do we have an unlevel playing field? And the short answer is yes, we do. Um, but And I think the question falls away if we agree that everyone has to apply and be accountable to the same minimum standards. But what I know about the media industry um, as a regulator is that their resistance to any form of regulation um, is a lot more of a Herculean task than, than that's broader than just uh, online advertising alone. And it might help if I provide sort of a short history lesson here on press standards in the UK which is that press regulation, very similar uh, to advertising um, uh, in some ways, um, is entirely voluntary where there aren't any statutory powers um, that compel news publishers to be regulated or meet any particular ethical code of conduct or standard. Um, and this isn't because we have a really balanced, pluralistic, um, high quality, high performing press sector. Rather, we've got this incredibly concentrated media market with most household name brands, um, subject to a few ownership structures, most of them offshore. Um, and since post-war Britain, we've had seven inquiries into malpractice and failing standards and public crisis and trust in the news media. Um, and each inquiry has proposed reform, um, but to low middling success, because we have to remember that uh, the press industry has a very powerful lobby, political lobby capacity, um, and has always advocated for pure market freedom interpretation of standard conducts and rules um, to protect its commercial interests. That's often sits under this veil of freedom of the press. But what we mean is unfettered ability to act in its own commercial interests. So um, we have to bear that in mind um, when we're talking about the standards we wish to apply, because yes, the Impress Code um, is the only press code in the UK that has a um, requirement to disclose publicly and transparently and clearly label um, significant uh, uh, conflicts uh, or disclosure of interests. Um, but we also have to remember as well that because of the voluntary nature of the regulatory system in the UK, um, Impress only reaches 15% of the news publishing market. So that's only 15% of news publishers applying that standard. And what does that mean for the public? Well, it means for the public that they're seeing widespread non-compliance with that standard. Um, and usually, again, help these household name brands. So the public also aren't aware of the standards that should be being applied to these types of arrangements, whether they're purely commercial, advertorial, sponsored, et cetera. Um, so the public aren't aware of what standards should be applied. And so they don't know how to act um, in a capacity to regulate this sort of uh, poor practice or, mal or malpractice. Um, and so for me, this comes down to this kind of broader um, existential integrity issue for publishers, which is kind of as old as publishing in the UK, which is, is your product um, your audience or is your product journalism? And I know it's not as straightforward as that, that uh, most publishers would say, I make journalism funded by advertising or funded by these commercial partnerships. Um, but if you're a self-defined media agent in you know, 2023, operating under all the market conditions of everyone else, and if you look and act and behave like a marketeer, if that's your principal purpose, um, my question then is, where's the editorial independence, which is what this all boils down to, which is, if you, I'm an informed consumer of news and information, can I see that the content that you're producing to me, that you're framing as news, is sufficiently independent of any paid interest sitting outside of it? Um, and if I can't make that distinction as a member of the public reading it, if there's no regulatory authority that can check and hold to account um, th those editorial practices, um, and and they're not subject to any minimum statutory requirement. Um, then, I, you know, the idea that the, that these self-defining media um, get to enjoy exemptions at law that any other individual, any other company, or any other trader has to apply, um, I, I, I think is inherently problematic. And that's that's a, a, a much wider existential issue about press and media regulation um, that's not just narrowly defined to online advertising alone. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much indeed, Lexi. I'm going to open up to some questions in a moment. I will invite all the panellists to make quick closing remarks. But just before we do, um, would any of the panellists like to pick up on anything 
that, that others have said in, in the last few minutes? Just very briefly, um, just on the Ipsos Mori research, I, I, I'm glad that uh, Emma has uh, uh, raised that point because it, it's a good one, that recognition, it's not the best, uh, well, sorry, it's not a perfect label, but it's the best label is, is the ASA sort of approach. And I think that there is some merit to that. And I think the CMA probably goes along with that to, to a large extent. I don't think that should mean that we should stop looking for a better way, uh, which is why I welcome, Jonathan, all of your great work in this space. And that research is really worth looking at because the recognition, even if you put advert in one example, is somewhere between 33% and 40 something percent. If you were blindfolded and you tossed a coin, you would be right more often than if you're looking at the post that says advertisement. That is a shocker. And the other point that Emma quite rightly raised is that sometimes the recipients of that uh, questionnaire or whatever it was, that survey, didn't recognize that brand created content labeled, this is from a brand, this is or has sales messaging in there, is an advert. And to me, that does tell us something. It tells us that the regulators might be using the word advert differently. Because even if you're using that word masking, is this an advert? And you think it obviously is. And 60, 70 percent of people, 80 percent of people say, I don't recognize it as such. I think that in itself is enough to warrant opening up the question of whether advert is the right frame. Thank you, Garant. OK, I'm going to open up some questions. Um, the first question, and can I just check with uh, that, that people can see these questions? It should be. Okay. Um, so the first question comes from um, Raoul Ferraconil, who is based at the University of Stravanger um, in Norway. Thank you for this great panel. Thank you, Raoul. Um, my question is about the research project. How do you account for the different degrees of opacity in labeling and dis or disclosure of commercial content, especially across so many countries? Um, well, I'd, I'd just like to respond to this briefly, but I'm, I'm going to invite my colleagues from the research project um, to say a few words before we finish. Um, so thank you, Raoul. You, you are one of our academic advisors um, with this project. And I suppose starting out to share this with the wider academic community, we want to try our best to learn from the errors of the past. Um, and, and one of the errors in comparative research, picking up the points Garant has just made uh, and others have made is to assume a fixity of meaning or a fixity of practice which can be applied uh, and usually misapplied to different countries. So I think it's also about Emma's keyword context. Um, uh, to share with you, when we started our project and we won our funding bid, we said we're looking at what are called similar systems. And it's true, most of them are. They're liberal democracies and market economies. They have commonalities and um, they are essentially the global north. However, we're wrong. Um, they're not similar systems because the EU contains post-communist countries who have only recently and rapidly transitioned to some structures of democratic governance and which are often not deeply embedded throughout all practices and institutions. So that's just one example. But I think if we're going to do justice to comparative research in this space, we not only have to understand the complexities happening within, broadly speaking, national frames, media systems, but very much um, draw on all the insights from cultural scholars, from scholars who looked at how meaning works in, in different contexts to it to inform our work. So yes, it's going to be very complex, but I think we should be guided by uh, what best practice suggests for comparative research and try to take the steps to get as close as we can. And the involvement of uh, you and others, Raoul, is really important to that. Um, okay, we've just gone dark here. Uh, in in uh, one of the top three universities for ecological um, practices. Um, okay, next question. Um, since the ASA, the Advertising Standards Authority, introduced the need for hashtag ad, social media platforms have introduced mandatory signals, and you can now label a post, quote, paid partnership or affiliate, etc. Does the Advertising Standards advice on mandatory use of hashtag ad need to advance along with these social media advancements? I think that's um, a question about how the chosen clarity that different platforms are adopting is sufficient and perhaps might be um, supported 
by the regulatory system. Now, Garant, I know you have views on this, so um, I I'll invite you and Emma to speak first, and then and Jason and any others who want to add. Garant. Emma, you are unmuted. I'm very happy for you to go. <laughs> um, Thank you. I, I wanted to, I wanted to make clear in the first place that hashtag ad isn't mandatory like that's not a mandatory requirement the yep. requirement is that you make clear when something is advertising the issue is in practice we are yet to see a way of doing that um that has challenged the best practice approach that we've kind of ended up with which is to use some form of ad labeling um in terms of the specific question about platform owned tools, um, they've developed quite quite rapidly. There was a point in time where it was only really Instagram that had one and only certain influencers were able to use it. That's now opened up. A lot more people can use it, but I'm not sure it's always mandatory necessarily. And there's, you know, it's not a requirement as such of the platform in a lot of places, uh, in a lot of contexts. Um, and some tools are better than others, and some tools are used more effectively and more consistently than others, and therefore are more recognizable than others. Um, so in answer to the question about um, our advice uh, and guidance, I mean, we consistently update um, our advice and guidance. We are about to publish uh, an updated influencers guide, which is our key resource in this area in uh, collaboration with the CMA. Um, we do acknowledge the use of platform tools, but ultimately it's at the end of the day, it, the onus is still on the person posting the content to make sure that when they have used that tool, that it is clear that it is advertising. Um, and whether that's through the wording that's, that's used in the tool or the placement of the tool or its contrast, the background of the image, all of these things need to be taken into consideration. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not a case of, oh, if you just use this tool, it will always be fine. As always, context is key. So. Thank you, Emma. And if you if you don't mind, um, we've got a connected question. So I'm going to invite you just to um, add anything to that and we'll take both together. So this is a question from Amber Burton. Thank you very much. Um, how can we seek accountability from the online platforms in the same way that influencers and advertisers should be held accountable? So if we've been focusing and discussing on some of the requirements and obligations for communicators, for creators or professional journalists. Um, Amber's asking, and it links to the last question we'll take um, about um, obligations and responsibilities for platforms. So um, I guess this links to the first question because that was a, perhaps a positive example of platforms generating their own um, disclosure labels. Um, but what's an answer, Emma, first to, to Amber's question too? accountability for the platforms um it's it's a difficult one really when you because it, the platform themselves are, are also effectively competitors uh in this space uh in terms of advertising so it's it's very difficult to put the onus and the the kind of responsibility for regulating in the hands of platforms when they are also trying to get their slice of whatever money is running through their influencers um, so I think it's it becomes a question of whether there needs to be wider um, statutory consideration of of the extent to which platforms might be regulated to certain standards, as opposed to not necessarily the advertising. The advertising's regulated via other means, but whether the the responsibility of platforms um, might be something that is considered in the round. Um, we have obviously some uh, relationship with uh, with the platforms directly. We uh, recently launched our uh, intermediary platform principles pilot, easy for you to say, um, that basically um, is kind of trying to show that, that the big players like the social media platforms and other uh, ad um, serving networks um, are raising awareness of the requirements of, for advertising and are helping us to uh, fulfill our regulatory aims um, by assisting where they're able to and where it's appropriate for them to do so. So there's kind of, th there's little things underway, but perhaps there is more a look at platforms and how they conduct themselves generally. Thank you, Emma. You open up the fascinating opportunities for a, a mix of statutory as well as self-regulation. Um, and its importance in that space. Very interesting. So uh, I am conscious of time, but um, Jason, would you like to um, answer those questions on kind of labeling 
um, and the disclosure labeling being used by platforms and the, and the question Amber raises about the accountability of platforms. Yes, I, I, I would. So when, when we looked at uh, the practice of Instagram a few years ago, we did indeed notice that um, one, one feature of paid partnership was that you couldn't always use it unless you had reached a certain number of followers or something. And one of the things which we wanted them to do was to open up access to that to a wider range of people so that any any influencer would be able to use the paid partnership um, logo and and indeed that's what the position is now and and we followed through on that when we produced our principles for um, platforms in november 2022 this is one of the things that we expect platforms to um to offer as part of their own professional diligence right that they should as a trader um, covered by consumer protection law um, make it possible for people who want to advertise through their social media posts uh, to make it clear that uh, that post is is commercially motivated in some way. Um, now we're we're not prescriptive about the phrase that they use or how that thing should be, how it should appear. But obviously, it needs to be sufficiently obvious. And and our view, similarly to uh, how Emma has described the ASA's view, is that you need to look at well, what is the result of that post. So somebody who posts and they use paid partnership or something else, but for whatever reason, you can't see it very clearly. It's not obviously advertising. Well, then they need to do something else. So they need to use their hashtag ad or some kind of clear statement. This is an advertisement. Um, and I hope that our guidance has been quite clear on that. And I think the joint guidance with the ASA will also be clear on this point so that people can know this is what they've got to do. But we go a little bit further even than that. So we also uh, require platforms to... Uh, carry out some form of appropriate monitoring, right? So that when people are posting something and it looks like it's an advert, there should be some kind of prompt uh, to, to prompt people to label using the platform tool. And, that, and, and you know, we've used our own sort of algorithms and um, clever, whizzy uh, technical means to identify suspected advertising on social media. And clearly platforms can do the same. So it's not difficult, it's not onerous for them to do that. It's just a thing that we think they should do. And then they should prompt somebody, you know, you, you maybe you should be labeling this. This looks like it might be an ad, that kind of thing. Um, and people, you know, not all adverts are, not, not all posts which look like adverts are adverts. You know, people might post about something they really like um, and they haven't been paid to do so. They, clearly they could be able to override that, but we would expect there to be, you know, more than just making a, a label available. And then um, platforms also ought to take Steps where it appears that something is an advertisement and it hasn't been labelled to sort that out. So that may be notifying the brand or in, in some cases it might involve taking down the post or um, preventing the, the influencer from continuing to post for a while. If somebody's, um, you know, there, sh there should be sanctions like that, because at the end of the day, using um, uh, using a, uh, a social media account to break the law is, is a breach of the platform's terms and conditions. And we'd expect them to enforce their terms and conditions appropriately as a matter of professional diligence. So all of that sort of stuff we set out in our principles. Um, and uh, you know, people, if people follow that, then the world will be a better place, I think we, we, we would say. Um, and I think, um, I think that answers both, both of those points, but uh, or if I missed a bit, I think I've, I've answered all of those. No, it's fine. And in fact, um, I want to take in, we've got two more questions. One of them is specifically directed at you, Jason. So I'm going to ask you to answer that but I'm going to just communicate the other question too um, because conscious of time I'd like to invite any of the panelists who would like to comment on that and um, we'll do this quickly because I want my colleagues in the branded content research project to say a few words before we close as well so Jason the question to you um, are we likely to see the draft digital markets competition and consumer bill published next month? I guess that's the first question. And does do you foresee the CMA using its new fining powers to tackle non-disclosed advertising, or are fines likely to be the last resort for only the biggest offender? So what's happening with the legislation, um, or the draft legislation, and um, a really important question about um, enforcement powers and how they might be used. Yeah. Oh, and I sorry, mean, yeah, no, actually do answer that. Yes, I'll answer it. 
I mean, I, I can't I can't answer myself the, the you know, when when are we going to see the legislation? That's that's with the Department for Business. It's subject to parliamentary timetables and all of the inner workings of government. So but I anticipate it will be soon. Uh, I think that the, it, the legislation is going to be laid and then it will go through Parliament and it will be subject to the normal parliamentary process. And that may mean that some of it changes, of course. I mean, we don't we don't know do we, what amendments are going to be put forward. Um, and what the final shape of it will look like. But what I anticipate it will be um, it, is that it, it will give the CMA the power to fine and to issue directions to businesses which will you know, be binding directions and businesses don't comply with them, then they will be uh, fined again. Um, we will continue to have the ability to use the court-based process, I think, which uh, we, we currently use. Um, that may be amended as well slightly. Uh, you know, in terms of well, which cases will fall under which category, when will we find people, you know, I can't really say what what we will do, because we, we still need to see the legislation as it will be, and we need to issue guidance on that, and that will be in, a, a part of an internal process, um, which involves lots of different people. Um, but, you know, in terms of the question as it's presented, um, if we had had fining powers, uh, when we have looked at some of the issues on social media, I, you know, and if they are as I imagine they will be, I don't see a good reason why we wouldn't have used fining powers uh, in some of the cases which we've looked at, right? I, you know, I mean, it, it, all of these things, it depends on what the legislation is, what the guidance eventually says and so on. But if we've got the power, then my anticipation is that we'll use the power, we will fine people because that's what the legislation says is appropriate, that's parliament's intention, that's what we as an enforcer would ought to use our power. Um, it doesn't follow that it's appropriate to fine in every case. Um, you know, sometimes it's appropriate to issue a direction. Sometimes it may there may be reasons why we wouldn't fine. You know, and this is something which we all set out in guidance um, in due in due course. Okay, thank you so much. It's wonderful to get such a timely answer to the question. I hope. Our audience agrees. I'm just going to read out the last question, but with five minutes to go, we don't have time to do it justice, um, as with so much. So the final question, thank you very much. Thank you for an insightful discussion. Thank you. Assuming that identification will be an issue in virtual platforms, how does the ASA consider immersive advertising? Now, um, I know there are people here, Emma's going to say something quickly on that, um, who are being exploring these issues. I had great pleasure in joining Garant um, as hosts of the Global Advertising Lawyers Alliance Association Conference, which um, considered how on earth hashtag ad functions when it's people walking around in a meta universe. And it was a fascinating discussion. So just to flag up, these are key issues for us. There'll be future events. It's a reminder that I hope you will get in touch with us as the organizers of this event so you can ensure you're on mailing lists uh, for, for, for our future work. Emma, you wanted to speak on this. Uh, yeah, it was literally just to say it sounds like a like a, a cop out, but context is key. And basically, it'll depend what it looks like. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time recently in various metaverses looking at various things just to get a feel of the space and kind of what's what's possible in these spaces. And some of those spaces it's very clear it's advertising because they just have virtual billboards, but other kind of experiences and kind of, you know, pop up bars in the metaverse. Um, are going to present a very different challenge and it'll depend what it looks like and what the audience understands from what it looks like um and so yeah i'm excited to see what these things look like and uh, and what we do to them okay thank you very much well they've been very patient in the closing moments i'd just like to invite my colleagues from the branded content governance project um ian professor ian mccurry from the university of sterling just to give a, a, a few brief comments, reflections, but also to connect this to our, our project work. And then um, also briefly, Patricia, if you would like to say um, something to that would be most welcome. So Ian. Uh, thanks, Jonathan, and thanks everybody. Um, and that extends to the audience actually as a whole, because it was so heartening to sort of um, see and listen to a group of people who um, really care about, if you like, the ongoing health of the media system. And I think this question of regulation is a big part of that. I suppose I pick out a couple of things that um, sort of uh, grab my attention. Um, I think Lexi made a really interesting observation, which we need to keep in mind about the difference between upstream and downstream regulation and finding the balance of that for our project, I think is quite important. Um, there was 
you know, big, big, big topics like time and space. So the rapidity and the transformation of the kind of creator production process um, makes compliance very, very difficult for some creators. And I think um, understanding that and bearing that in mind is an important um, experience that we need to explore with creators and with um, the regulators. Um, lots of talk about gifts. And of course, academics, um, and I know the audience has got lots of academics in it, and, and, and many people think a lot about um, the gift economy and the intersection between the gift economy and any kind of commercial and commodity process. So that's really fascinating for us to see that conception come alive in kind of practical discussions of the implementation of regulation in practice, because there's a, a huge kind of conceptual hinterland around that that I think we're now prompted to explore a bit more. Um, and I think con control um, is obviously a, a key preoccupation in terms of regulation, but it also um, makes me think a little bit about changing models of what advertising actually is and how it works and whether actually uh, the control of communication is compatible with what some people talk about as a persuasion model of advertising. But there are other models of advertising where just presence is an issue. So the balance of presence and persuasion as a kind of arbitrating factor in the influence of these kinds of um, uh, advertising, if we can call it that, um, activities is really, really important. And again, something for us to explore. I, very conscious of time, so I'll just say that there was two or three other things that um, I'm going to sum up just by using one word answers. Uh, we need to think about the balance of um, complexity and coherence in whatever systems emerge. Um, I also thought, um, and uh, Emma highlighted this, context, I added it at the end to the list because I think it is important, but also, and I think um, both Jason and Geraint talked about this, um, comprehensiveness, but also comprehension in terms of um, what people are doing within and for the system. Because I think anything that, um, you know, comprehensiveness is hugely um, ambitious, um, on the other hand, so also is um, this idea that what we do is needs to be comprehended. So hopefully that's a little sum up, but um, most of all, I just want to say one, one thing, which was thank you to everybody for a really fascinating and stimulating uh, conversation. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ian. Just a brief um, words because we are, we are late. Uh, I would like to thank to everybody to stick here. Academy needs uh, to all to, to improve the, the project. I think that all the participation of the every part of the system in advertising is uh, very, very important to, to build a, a very a, a future of the advertising world. And uh, we don't have more time, but I think that the base of all is a responsibility education and knowledge and ethical behavior, not only to, to talk uh, in different or separate parts, uh, collaborate together, also not only in the technical point of view, also in the in the point of humanist and, and to build a better society. So I think that uh, this project is very important for that. And thank you so much for your participation. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, with permission of my panelists, I'm going to relieve them of the obligation to speak anymore because I think keeping to time is important. And Alex, could, if we could have the last slide, um, I, I really just want to extend my thanks, my very deep thanks and appreciation to all the speakers who've contributed with such insight and generosity in sharing their insights um, this afternoon. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Um, I'd like to thank the Mexa Policy Network who supported this event, all the participants involved in our branded content governance project, and we've left you some contact details, but most of all to you. Um, I know there are academics who've attended this event it's an incredibly busy time, not least in the UK, um, uh, and, and to students. I really do hope that this has been a valuable uh, meeting. Um, you are most welcome. Keep a lookout for future events. And thank you all for coming this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you all. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks all. Cheerio. Thanks, Ian. <laughs>